Is a 50 year old computer retro or vintage? All this and more on this week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Hooray for Hori. A CFAX emulator using live data feeds. Tomb Raider Advance. Decades of fun, computers built to last. All these stories and more on This Week in Retro. Up to date news for out of date tech. So, Chris, before we get started, uh, I just want to say well done on our first episode. Uh, I thought you did really well, and that's certainly reflected in the comments that we had on the show. We had a lot of positive comments left last week on, uh, first of all, positive comments towards John to thank him for thank him for his service. I feel like I should salute him. Thank you, John. <laughs> and um, also a, a big welcome to you uh, and lots of positive thoughts on, on your performance. And I, I think this is your first podcast that you've been involved in. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'm very grateful for those comments as well. They do help. <laughs> yeah, so you're a natural and um, uh, long may it continue. I'm looking forward to making lots more shows with you. Um, other things to talk about just before we get into this week's stories. Oh, first of all, a quick plug because my uh, the proof has arrived for the coloring book of retro computers. This is a book that I made last year. I've been working on and it's what funded the cave here. And uh, if you're on audio only, I'm just holding it up. It's sort of an A4 sized coloring book filled with over 30 pages of awesome uh, illustrations by Stu Cambridge of Sensible Software fame um, of all our favorite retro computers ready to be colored in. Um, I've approved the proof. It's going to the factory now. So if you back the Kickstarter, uh, you will get that very, very soon. If you didn't, it'll be in the RMC shop soon. And uh, really pleased to deliver another Kickstarter. We talk about Kickstarters a lot on the show and they come and they go. And um, you're only you're only as good as your last Kickstarter, Chris, I firmly believe. <laughs> so uh, it's nice to, to be able to deliver uh, another one. We are admittedly uh, about a month late on delivering it because of um, certain things that happened COVID-wise. Um, it was impossible to avoid certain delays and things, but we're there now and we're going to get it into people's hands. So very pleased with that. Nice. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to talk about was an interesting question that came up as a comment over on my channel from commenter Tempest Fury. What a great mm. name. Um, and despite the angry name, it was a constructive comment. It wasn't a straight up trolling comment. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it. And it was left on my unboxings video. And they said about the unboxings, they said, those aren't retro donations. They are vintage. And he qualifies this by saying, retro is something that looks, acts, plays in a style that is older. Not sure why most get that wrong. Playing an Atari isn't retro gaming while playing a brand new 8-bit game is retro gaming. So Chris, my question is, have we been getting it wrong? Should we be talking about this week in vintage gaming and not retro? Is language important here? Oh, uh, well, Neil, I hate to say it, but he raises a fair point. Um, and this is actually what I've brought up myself in another retro gaming community. Um, they basically do video responses to each other. So somebody will raise a question and then other people give their ideas on that that question mm -hmm. and um that one of the questions was uh, what is retro and indeed it, it's in the style of so my examples here just looking around um i've got a spectrum 48k here an original that's not retro because it's the original it's not in the style of it's the original whereas mm -hmm. this atari flashback 9 which may get me some hate but that is is retro because it's not the original but it is in the style of like, apart from those horrendously round buttons at the top <laughs> um another couple of examples i've got an original box copy of driller again for the spectrum um that is not retro because it's the original whereas this which is by a company in russia called zoysia travel through time northern lights that is for the zx spectrum even though it's made in the modern day so i would consider that as retro because obviously it's game in the style of a previous that's, period that's, but it's not just from to go that period off on a tangent that's a nice looking box is that it's like a big box spectrum game it's nice yes yeah, so so they do <laughs> and look i'm just a customer i'm not here to plug for them um but they've they've got a nice selection it's quite fairly small selection but growing of games and they actually make their games available for free um to download so you can download and play any of their games and they're really high quality um what kind of game is if that? you do if you do that's a driving game okay um you've got screenshots on the back you might not be able to pick them up on my webcam and that's actually a window through to the manual so the manual 
you're actually looking at the back of the manual at that point. Really nicely packaged. They include a poster. They include a CD soundtrack for if you want to play that in the background. And they actually, we didn't really have these in, on the Spectrum back in the day, but they do cut scenes in their games. So they really do put <laughs> a lot of effort on. So, yeah. So, yeah. But that is stuff. retro, not vintage in your opinion. I, I, I would say that, yeah. So getting back to the, art, the question, um, Neil, I'd argue... Even vintage, I don't know, is vintage pushing it? Because may, maybe the word classic, um, and I guess this applies to anything like furniture and cards and clothes and toys, you'd think for vintage, someone before now would have drawn a line in the sand and said, for example, I don't know, anything over 100 years is vintage. Um, I've got a grandfather clock actually in the other room. That's from the 1800s. I'd happily call that vintage. Oh, but, but is would, my age... would you call that vintage or would you call that antique? <laughs> well, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe you are right. Maybe it's antique. Because, you know, I really can't put that grandfather clock in the same category as my A1200 or any of the machines behind me. It just doesn't seem right. So, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I, I simply can't compare the two. Is that your understanding, though, Neil, that there's no line in the sand to define the word vintage? Well, um, I've got the dictionary definition here to fall back on to try and uh, try and give us some, some definition. So it's from Cambridge Online Dictionary, this one. Vintage, produced in the past and typical of the period in which it was made, e.g. a vintage comic book. Okay. Retro, similar to styles, fashions, etc. from the past. Mm. Um, and both both have old suggested as a synonym so um yeah i mean the way you've described it is the way it is in the dictionary retro similar in style vintage mm. um produced in the past so hmm um it would appear that we're talking about vintage computers and vintage computer games uh, and when we talk about modern remakes it would be correct to call them retro um however does that mean we should make a concerted effort to double check and to be careful of our use of the word retro? And if you'd asked me, let's say 10 years ago, if you'd asked me about that, I would have been really pedantic about it. And I probably would have said, yes, we should. Um, but in those 10 years, I've I've moved about and I've tried badly, but I've tried hard to uh, to learn a second language. And on occasion, I found myself dependent on using that second language to be understood very badly. And simply being understood became more important to me than any other aspect of language when you're put in that situation. Spelling, grammar, all important, but none of them came close to just being understood. You know, I want to buy that baguette, please. So I didn't go <laughs> hungry. It did, I didn't care if, if the grammar was wrong. So um, I think that retro... Is understood, And we do have an international audience, by the way. Not everyone has English as their first language. Not everyone who is into retro gaming and computing or vintage gaming and computing has English as their first language. And I think it is universally understood what we mean when we say the word retro. Um, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't forget, Neil, we've also got Retro Gamer magazine, which reviews and explores vintage games. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Well, what I mean is, you know, it talks about the originals under the title of retro. Um, so, have they got it wrong, Neil? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's an interesting point, I think, and it's something yeah. we could discuss for an entire show. So, uh, thank you to Tempest Fury for making that con comment. I think you're entirely correct, but I also think that language changes and evolves according to popular use. And I think that's mm. what we might see happen with retro if we haven't already seen that happen. Is that the word retro will just encompass vintage until we get to the point where we're having this conversation of is it retro or vintage or is it antique that day will come uh but you know i i think i don't i don't know where we draw the line as to where something becomes antique or not um yeah we'll have that conversation again in 50 years time um however you know it's a democracy here this week in retro so i i think we should have a vote on it um i'm in favor of continuing to use the word retro for vintage purposes what do you think chris well uh, yeah as i said neil i've raised this is that same point myself so do i do i vote for vint no i'm gonna go with retro as well <laughs> just <laughs> okay. works retro it is retro it is but if you don't like that every time we say retro um hear the word vintage or take a shot uh, whatever works for you <laughs> it could be a new game um so retro it is the committee has decided add it to the minutes let's begin <laughs> 
The age-old question of controllers comes up again this week, Chris. What's the perfect stick for your particular method of retro gaming? In the past, you might have gone with something like uh, an 8-bit do pad uh, or 8-bit do. 8-bit do? 8-bit do? I can't remember how you say that properly. (laughs) (laughs) One of the two. Again, I'm understood. Let's not have that conversation again. You may have an adapter to let you use original hardware. Perhaps you went with a great big X arcade control panel on your desk or integrated as part of your arcade cabinet. There are all kinds of ways of approaching it and finding your perfect controller for retro gaming. I, of course, only game with a monster joystick that that's not entirely true uh, they don't sponsor this particular show but <laughs> but um you know I, in honesty in all honesty i've got my monster joysticks i've got a whole range of pads and sticks depending on what system i'm using but sometimes quite often in fact i'll fall back to a trusty playstation 3 joypad i have to say it's a usb you know works on a lot of devices um and it it just feels right you know the ergonomics of joypads has evolved to that point where you use that and it sits in your hand, right? You go back and use a, uh, or you don't go back, you use a modern USB recreation of the NES joypad, for example, and it just doesn't sit right in your hands. You'll, you'll have cramp before a few minutes, or at least I do. So I don't mind mixing and matching according to uh, what fits my hands best. Um, uh, Chris, how about you? Are you a purist? Have you tried lots of options? Have you got a joystick of choice? What do you like to use? Yeah, well, I, do, I certainly have joysticks of choice, but I am a cheap skate Neil, <laughs> um, and we've got a we've got a house full of Xbox 360 controllers, so that's what I'll tend to plug into the PC for either modern or retro gaming. I do have a Thrustmaster Hottest um, flight stick for the PS4 that also works on the PC for flight sims, some more modern stuff, flight sims and Elite Dangerous. But to be honest, Neil, um, going back to a conversation from last week, that's sitting to one side, waiting for me to pair it up with a VR headset. But that's a whole other cop. Uh, topic yeah. we've already covered um i've also got one of those you almost just mentioned it then one of those dirt cheap snes t- style controllers which works fine for me just for emulation um for my original hardware i'd love a zip stick again because it's the only joystick i never broke back in the day um but until i can afford one um it's uh, i've got a cheetah 125 and a couple of quick shot quick shot two clones horses for courses neil really depends on what i'm playing why what what is there a new option yeah. There is a new option. I like that you mentioned the zip stick there because, um, God, this is how deep I am into the hobby. I think I spent (laughs) £7 this week on eBay on the zip stick box. Just the box. (laughs) There was no joystick. It was just a piece of cardboard. (laughs) This is my future, Neil. (laughs) I know. And then it arrived and uh, I rebuilt it. So it was a nice uh, cube. I put my zip stick in it and then I shrink wrapped it and then I put it on the shelf and looked at it. I mean, I think I've got problems, Chris, but it made me so happy to reunite that stick with that box. <laughs> that would make me happy, Neil, playing with that zip stick you've just imprisoned in a box. <laughs> well, then now, now I get the joy of opening it as if it's new. I can, I can go Fair into enough. the shop and, pick it off the shelf <laughs> and wrap it again and repeat. Um, and you mentioned your hot ass stick. Um, dare mm. I ask, is it is it the A10 style stick? Because I know they're like the best part of £500 for the. Oh, the no way. The again, no. cheapskate. It's it's the cheap one, um, just, just called a hot ass four. And I waited for it to be on special, on, on sale. <laughs> Oh, okay. It's about seventy dollars, um, so about thirty thirty five pounds. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, yes, you are you are correct in asking if there's a new option. There is a new competitor that's entered the market, and it's not to be ignored because it's a well known brand in the arena. Uh, if you've not heard of them, Hori are a Japanese company founded back in 1969. They're in the same school of arcade controls as Sanwa and Simetsu, um, and all those other Japanese companies, and and they were the first. I believe, the first to make third-party accessories, um, officially licensed ones for the likes of Nintendo and Sony and companies like that. So it's a company with a huge amount of experience in this area. Now, Hori have shared online their idea for a new joystick aimed squarely at the retro market. And instead of just dumping on us and saying, here's the stick, buy it, they're um they're showing some images and inviting feedback to try and really get this right first time which i think is very wise and much appreciated by the community i'm sure so hopefully duncan can pop some of those images on the screen while we're talking about it Uh, for those who are listening on audio we'll describe them or i will so there are three images the first of which is proposed is just this wide arcade stick You'd put this on your desk. It's got a nice, what looks like a nice sturdy base on it. 
that was always the problem back in the day wasn't it when you bought say a quick joy or something mm. they had quite a small yeah. base and they had suction cups and if they didn't work you could be flapping all over the place this is nice and wide nice arcade style stick it's got eight arcade style buttons a joystick on the left hand side to the left of the joystick is a trackball and then to the left and above that is a spinner along the top you've got some smaller buttons which you could perhaps set for insert coin start quit all of those things you'd probably map them in your emulator according to what you need so there's um six of them so you hopefully shouldn't need to grab a keyboard um and yeah, it, it looks, I guess, like a classic fighting stick with a spinner and a trackball added. The second picture is uh, it breaks the design out into individual device devices. So you've got a joystick on its own with buttons. You've got um, a trackball. You've got a spinner, all, all smaller in design. And I guess they must all individually plug in. I don't know if they would daisy chain to one another or if they'd go all individually go into the machine. I don't know, but that's how they're presented. And then the third image is uh, the idea of a modular device. So you can slot together your perfect combination, be it two joysticks that slot next to each other, two trackballs. You might want a joystick in the middle and eight buttons either side. You might want a joystick, buttons, and a trackball. You could just slot it all together in this Transformer-style design exactly how you want it. So, Chris, three designs. What do you make of them? Is there a need for this device? And if so, would you go for it? <laughs> Do you remember when Homer Simpson helped design a car, Neil, and put everything oh, yes. he'd ever wanted <laughs> into one single design? Do you recall how that ended? It ended <laughs> it very badly. Well. <laughs> it did indeed. Um, so this does make me feel a little like that. However, that modular idea um, and that, that design, I guess, makes that workable because at least then you can pick and choose. Um for the most part, I mean, I don't see a steering wheel in the option, so it's nothing outlandish like that. Or, sure. You know. um, a trackball, I mean, what's that for? Other than Missile Command and Marble Madness, what else am I going to use the trackball for? Um, and trackballs, I'm sorry, Neil, they do remind me of school and an art program we had on the BBC <laughs> Micro and very little other memories outside of that. Um, so to be honest, I guess it brings it back to, for me, um, I, if I was just buying another retro joystick, I would be just wanting one or two joysticks, six fire buttons for each. That's Street Fighter 2 sorted. That's Mortal Kombat sorted. Am I missing something there? What would you choose? Well, um, if you just step back from the games themselves, a trackball can be a useful if you consider it to be a mouse instead of a track, you know, if you want to navigate around your operating system or whatever. Um, so it's kind of useful in that respect. There are games that use it, but I agree. There's not a huge number of um, high quality games that you'd want to use a trackball. But those that do use it, uh, Marble Madness, um, 720, games like that, you know, they feel right with the trackball. They just, they, they feel all wrong if you try and play them with, play the arcade version with the joystick. I know there are home yeah. ports that overcome that. Um, but in terms of choice, I'm quite torn here because I can see a use for all three designs. A simple stick with three buttons plus the small menu buttons would be perfect for, say, emulating the PC engine or a master system or, you know, one of those 8 bit consoles. Um, but then um, on MAME or in the Mister, I might want to jump from Marble Madness to with a trackball to Arkanoid with a spinner. I might want mm. two joysticks for Robotron or Smash TV. It's difficult. So I, I want all of them, Chris. I, w I want all of them. I would say, <laughs> I would say the all-in-one design has the trackball far too close to the joystick. And would you play Marble Madness? You, at least I, I really slap the. <laughs> yeah. I really slap the ball, Chris. When I'm playing Marble Madness, <laughs> uh, and I, and I worry that my hand would smash. <laughs> oh God, this gets worse. I worry that my hand would hit the joystick <laughs> when I'm slapping the ball. So um, I don't really like that layout. Um, uh, yeah. So um, when it comes to the modular style, uh, mm. um, uh, quality would be key. Uh, I'm I'm sure the buttons and the joysticks themselves are top notch, coming from who's making it. But I and I would need that to be a good weighty base. I wouldn't want it to creak. Because obviously you're slotting a lot of things. There's a lot of joins. Are all those plasticky joins going to creak and, you know, rattle? Yeah, true. Nobody, nobody yeah. wants that if they've spent good money on a joystick. And then on the individual designs, well, they risk just being just another joystick in a market that's full of fight sticks and, and joysticks right now. So I'm not sure how well that would stand out from the crowd on its own. 
the individual trackball and an individual spinner, I think that would probably do well if they kept it simple and just bought that out for those who want that. Um, it's a bit like the Amiga Mini, you know, the A500 Mini we were talking about. A lot of people would just love that USB tank mouse. Um, mm. A lot of people would just love a trackball, I think. Uh, but I'm not going to sit on the fence, um, and I'm at risk of doing that right now. So um, uh, I'm going to go with the all-in-one design with everything on it, but with the redes- with a redesigned layout so that that trackball is not too close. Uh, and if you want two-player, then I would say you buy two of them instead of trying to fight over one long or maybe it won't be long enough it depends how you've built it if you've got the modular layout you might be sat too close together you might end up having to put spacer modules in the middle to make room for two players um i think that gets a bit messy if it's not well thought out enough and it's so much better if you've got a joystick each so I, I, that's what i'm going to go with the all in one design one joystick each for two players yeah fair enough I think for me, given that there are other joysticks available, I'd, I'd probably concentrate on the point of difference. You know, concentrate on that nice, robust but affordable, like you said, the trackball and maybe the paddle, maybe a combo of those two for the niche gamers and and those niche games that actually make use of those. Because um, that's probably that probably is a bit of a gap in the market, I think. Um, but I'd leave the button bashes to those already on the market unless they're going to do it better. Um, that yeah. would be my take on it. Yeah, and the only th- the only other thing that I'm surprised at is they haven't put buttons on the sides. Often, when you're making an all-in-one um, controller, you have the side buttons for the pinball games. So they might mm. want to add something like that to them. Anyway, thank you to user r underscore retro hacking for sharing the story on our subreddit. We'll be watching this one develop with interest. Do you recall reading CFAX on your TV, Neil, or even Oracle, its evil twin? I do. I do recall reading CFAX, Oracle, or Teletext, as it was later called. And I'm going to be honest, this is the third time we've tried to record this segment of the show because I've called Chris John twice, I <laughs> completely drink, accidentally. I <laughs> it's stuck. The, 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 the name John just... I need I need to get it out of my head. It's Chris. So, yes, Chris, I was a daily user of it, and I apologize once again for repeatedly calling you John. <laughs> it's all good. Had to happen. <laughs> right. So we're talking about <laughs> CFAX and Oracle. So you did use it, Neil. That's great. I did use do it, you, Chris. <laughs> do you think, though, Neil, Neil <laughs> that you could recall a page number all these years later? Yeah, well, the obvious one that I think everyone will remember was 888, which was across all the channels, and that would bring up sub- subtitles. Now, I wasn't that well-traveled back then, so I, I don't know if other countries, they must have had a similar um, system to, to cater for the for the deaf, and 888 would drop out of teletext. It would give you your program that you were watching, and it would put subtitles along the bottom. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, I, I didn't need to use that much, but you asked me if I remembered a number and, and and that's the number I remember. But other than that, it was mostly channel four where I would do my, was it teletext on channel four? I think it was teletext on four. And um, was I would Oracle check it. Oh, Oracle was renamed anyway, to teletext. Yeah. <laughs> it was a yeah. long time ago. It was a long time ago, but it was usually in the morning I would check. I think channel four, yeah. the page numbers were in the 400s. And the two that I went to the most were Bamboozle, which was an interactive quiz. Um, it's like mid 400s, 450s, I think it was. And um, uh, the second or third television we had in the house, we were lucky enough to have fast text. So you had uh, the different colored buttons. Instead of having to type the numbers in, you could press the different yes. colored buttons, couldn't you, to go to the pages. Um, yeah. Or in the case of Bamboozle, you would press the reveal button. So there would be a joke and the punchline would be hidden and you'd press reveal to make the, the punchline appear. Um, yeah, I remember that. And then, of course, Digitizer. A lot of people who listen to this in the UK will remember Digitizer, which was the video game pages. Um, that was on a higher number. Can't remember what number, but it's higher than 450, I think. It was such a long time ago, but yeah, it was a big part of my daily life. It really was. And then it was gone. Nice. Nice to meet another teletexter. Um, <laughs> you can find out for sure if your memory of numbers is is correct, though, Neil. Um, Reddit user It's All Pipes shared this amazing online CFAX emulator, simulator, recreation, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm not actually sure how this thing works, but it works, and all from within your browser um, at nathanmediaservices.co.uk slash teletext um, hyphen viewer. Um, obviously, we'll put that link in the uh, in the show notes. 
Um, but basically, yeah, for those that might not be familiar with what Teletext was, maybe because of the country you're from, or maybe just never bothered to press that button on your TV remote, it was basically a way of um, receiving pages of just plain text or at least ASCII, there was sometimes some ASCII art-based information. And it was actually broadcast along with the normal TV channel data to your television. So you didn't need a computer or anything like that. You just needed a compatible television set. Um, and it also depended on which channel you were watching as to what data you would receive. So they could actually you know, um, double up on the, the number of pages um, by... You, BBC One had one set of pages, BBC Two. There might be some repetition, but it could also have a completely different set of pages. Very, very clever technology. Um, teletext service, so to answer the question you raised um, earlier, Neil, in terms of other countries, from a quick bit of research I did, it was available in Australia as Austext. Um, okay. That was broadcast via Channel 7 uh, from 1982 to 2009. Um, the American uptake seems a little bit more complica uh, complicated and a little bit more muddy. Um, this is only going from what Wikipedia tells me, in all honesty, but um, they ended up trialling CFAX and also a French system called Annie Antiope, if I'm probably pronouncing that terribly wrong. Okay. You've tried to learn French, haven't you, Neil? So you can correct yeah. <laughs> That's a long that. time ago. <laughs> yes. Um, but they, they ended up coming out with their own standard known as NABTS, which is catchy, um, which stands for North American Broadcast Teletext Specification. Um, but again, from my research, it sounds like it was a bit short-lived. Um, but anyway, you can, re now, you can now relive the glory days um, of using this passive information service from your browser. Um, to be honest, Neil, when I saw this story posted, I wasn't too sure about it. But as soon as I clicked on the link, I was actually surprised at the nostalgia hit it gave me. Um, and I was even more surprised at how muscle memory kicked in, which is why I asked you if you remembered <laughs> any page numbers. Um, on the website, basically, when you go there, you'll see um, a, a main uh, screen, which is the CFAX feed. Um, and you also have a virtual TV remote to one side. So, and you can use that to click the number buttons to select your page numbers, but also the function buttons that puts you into um, teletext mode and um, in, uh, then out of that so you can change channels then back into teletext mode. You can overlay teletext with the TV feed, and it's just test patterns for their TV feed. Um, sure. It's actually really well done. Um, but the page numbers I instantly remembered. So I navigated away from the main page to one of the numbers that it gave me on the screen. I think it was news was the first one I went to. And then without even thinking, I typed in 100 to go back to the main menu. Now, this is... <laughs> You know, 25, 30 years ago, I would have last done that. I seriously, you know, didn't do this much out of my teenage years, and yet it was there. 500, instinctively, I typed that for the entertainment section. Um, the difference with this one is it's actually a live feed. So it's not just simulating teletext from back in the day, uh, and we'll unpack this a little bit later, but it's actually modern news being fed into the CFAX format, which is trippy. Yeah. Um, it also does page skipping. So you always see the page numbers ticking over trying to find the page that you've you've asked for. And back in the day, the page that you really wanted to see would often not work for whatever reason. It would just keep ticking over. And you'd see it, say, for example, if I typed in 555 for games, you'd see it searching through the page numbers and then it would just skip 555 skip, every time. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and you'd you, be like, oh, no, you, you have to that? wait for it to yeah. come all the way back round again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was always the, the one you most wanted to look at. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think there's a really really cool little simulator and emulator. You can play uh, bamboozled on it, Neil. I found that on channel two under page one fifty, um, okay. and also on channel four under page three ninety. So there might, looks like there's a little bit of duplication there. Um, yeah. You can read digitizer, Neil. It's on there. <laughs> I found that on channel two page four seventy, uh, reviewing modern games. So there's mentions of Call of Duty and stuff like that in there. Um, awesome. And in fact, I was reading Digitizer today, Neil, and it seems uh, you can even write to them at digitizer2000 at gmail.com. Uh, that's Digitizer with an S, by the way. And there was a comment on there, and I quote, keeping in mind these are modern day posts, Neil, and somebody had written into them and said, is Alien Breed Special Edition 92 still at the top of the Amiga charts? <laughs> Which I found hilarious. Um, and they've yeah. also, they've also said, also, is Alien Breed 3D review coming anytime soon or something that works to that effect? 
and they ended it off with ST sucks. Now, look, no comment from me. <laughs> Let's not yeah. start that war again. Uh, but I found you, that you had an ongoing joke about the Amiga, and they were always yeah. making fun at the Amiga. So, yeah, yeah, the, the legacy lives on. <laughs> and funny enough, their response to that letter is exactly along those lines, and jumping into the fact that the ST had MIDI ports straight away. So they're carrying on that. It's it's really nice to see they're having a bit of fun with this. Have you tried it, Neil? Any thoughts? I did. I, I have tried it, yeah. And it did, like you, it took me by surprise because I was expecting to find an archive of old pages, just like there is on another great website, which is archive.teletextarchaeologist.org. And what they do on that site is they extract teletext data from VHS recordings and then they archive them. Uh, it's like a kind of witchcraft. You know, you'll put a VHS tape in, press play. It might be a... Uh, an old episode of Neighbours or something, and you're, you're watching Harold Bishop and Mrs. Mangle and Bounce of the Dog. But actually, what they're able to do is extract those teletext pages from whatever part of the uh, the video stream, whatever, however they do it, I really don't know. But they managed to extract the data from it, which um, it, it just seems magical. Uh, just as teletext did back, back in the day, because in the UK, of course, it was all transmitted over the air as an analog signal into our aerials. I don't know if perhaps in the US you mentioned their services. I don't know if they came down cable or in Australia, but that's how it worked um, over here. So all of these years later, it still seems like a kind of magic the way <laughs> the teletext works. And um, But no, that, that's on that website, on the teletext archaeologist. But on this one that you've mentioned... It's all the up-to-date news and headlines. So I was really surprised when I went to 101 for the news and I saw today's news headlines. Uh, it must be pulling this info from, I, I don't know, feeds from from current websites uh, to keep it up-to-date. And there was just this weird moment when my brain saw the old and the new colliding as if the service had never stopped. You, know, you, you even have to wait for the numbers to tick around, like you said. So it was nice. Um, and I might even use it... I found the sports section really interesting for whatever reason. Um, you know, my favorite sports going off to pay-per-view and things like that. I don't follow sport as much as I did when I was a kid, when I was using teletext, I used to go and watch the foot, check the football results and things like that on teletext. This, this might be the way to get me back into regular sports watching. I'll go use this teletext tile service to check the results. Maybe. <laughs> no, I, that VHS archive sounds amazing, Neil. Um, and I'm going to have to do some thinking now. That, that, look, it's a, a, such a finite chance that something would have been recorded by the sound of the way that archives put together. Um, but basically, I don't know if you remember, back in the day, some of the pages that were aimed at teenagers with too much time on their hands, they were almost like a bulletin board and people left comments and then other people would respond mm -hmm. to those comments. And you did that by because obviously there was no two-way interaction with the service itself. You had to ring a number and you left the message and if they deemed it worthy, they would publish that message and i got a comment published which felt amazing and what i did this is my one chance neil to say something okay. meaningful to the world or ask a meaningful question so this is this is what i had published on on teletext george is a hippo bungle is a bear but does anybody know what zippy is <laughs> <laughs> so that may be completely lost on some of our international followers. Um, we certainly don't have time to get, unpack that now. So just look up <laughs> Zippy, Rainbow, Children's TV, and then you'll know what we're talking about if you're not familiar with that. Um, so do that in your own time. Question, I don't think the question has ever been answered. <laughs> I don't think it had. And you know what? There was so many responses to that question that I posted. <laughs> some people said a snake. Um, the best response was a puppet. And I thought, genius. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Yes, Zippy is a puppet. Um, but yes, Neil, I mean, before the internet 2.0, Facebook, Twitter, and the rest of that, I was interacting with the world, asking the important questions, I feel. Um, but it, it's such a slim chance that my comment has been part of an archive from a VHS tape. I really doubt it's out there, but it would be amazing if it has. Um, Oh, let's see, when would it have been? It would have been summer holidays, probably 1991, because I remember one of the girls that I that told me she read my comment on the television. It would have been the summer when Brian Adams was at number one. So I'm on it, Neil. I'm, I'm on that You're site on and I'm going to yeah. find it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, exactly. The, the site we're talking about now, um, it's live data. And I had that same trippy, that initial trippy feeling when I read, read the news of that new colliding with the old. Um, and just to read that modern live uh, news feed in 
the old teletext style service was was quite amazing. It's certainly interesting to be reading modern headlines and news in a distraction free format. I'll give it that. Perhaps we should add this feature back into modern TVs. And speaking of that, do check out the link in the show notes as the creator of this, um, Alastair Cree, aka ZX Guesser, even includes instructions on how to use a Raspberry Pi to use your TV to do exactly that. Our next story was submitted by Croc Carmen on the on the subreddit, and it's dubbed "The Impossible Port" by Modern Vintage Gamer on his video on the topic. That port being the original Tomb Raider running on the humble Game Boy Advance. Doesn't matter if you're not a fan of Tomb Raider. Doesn't matter if you're not a fan of their their Game Boy Advance in particular. Anyone can look at this thing and marvel at the technical achievement. I think it's a wonderful thing to behold. And to be clear, this is the 3D version of Tomb Raider that we saw on the PC and the PlayStation back in the day. Until now, any Tomb Raider games on the GBA have been 2D affairs. Now, the secret source to all of this is a project called Open Lara, which is an open source recreation of the Tomb Raider engine. And with significant efforts by developer Tima Gagiev, uh, aka X Progger, uh, he's got it to work on the GBA. Open Lara is also adapted for the 3DO, the Switch, Windows, Linux, Android devices, the Xbox, all, all kinds of systems on which you can run this open source uh, engine. But seeing it on the tiny screen of the GBA running on the limited power that's available to it from its ARM CPU, this is not a device that was ever designed with 3D gaming in mind. In the past, we've seen the GBA described as having hardware performance on a par with the Super Nintendo. This should be nowhere near PlayStation territory and 3D gaming territory. But here we are with this project. Um, yeah, try try doing this on a Super Nintendo, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I had a quick look at um, MVG's footage, Neil. And I'll be honest, my, non- my knowledge of the GBA is limited. My boys had them, but I never had one, never played with theirs. But you've put it nicely into context with the SNES comparison. Um, what I do know is Tomb Raider in the early days of my PC ownership was a franchise I didn't even bother with until well into the Pentium era. Um, can it play Doom for me turned into can it play Tomb Raider? And neither my Amstrad 386DX or my IBM PS1 486SX um, were up to the task. They were demanding games. So this is a real feat. The footage I've seen looks totally playable on a GBA, Neil. Yeah, it does. I mean, we've got to be honest, uh, the frame rate is impressive, but not silky smooth. Um, it, it's it's at a speed that's completely playable. And in the context of the year, I mean, when did the GBA come out? Was it 2000, 2001, something like that? It might have even been late 90s. I'd need to check that. But we would have, it would have blown your mind. If you'd seen this come out then, it would have been absolutely mind-blowing. Um, and it's a testament i think to the quality of the current developers who are out there not just working on this project but other projects for old um devices yeah, they're revisiting their own gaming routes to see what they can squeeze out of the systems with their modern day knowledge and no doubt with modern development tools available to them that they don't require specialist hardware that you have to you know sign an nda away to get from nintendo or anything like that there's all these yeah, you've got emulators to test them on you've got modern tools and um, they've, they've just done a great job. And this is a real reflection of modern retro slash vintage d- developers showing us the capabilities of our favorite systems in a way that we've never seen before. Now, Tomb Raider itself was an eye-opening game in, in my own personal game in history because it's one of the very first games that I tried with a 3D FX patch. So I remember just flicking between the two executables for the game and marveling at the difference between the the 3dfx one and the software rendered one it was like i had suddenly jumped 10 years into the future just by running this executable and seeing that hardware acceleration there and then it was just absolutely mind-blowing um you mentioned that you uh you went through a period of can it run tomb raider chris did you get there was it a game that you spent a lot of time of when you did eventually get a pc that you could run it with (laughs) well yeah yeah i did um Look, I played it on. I played Tomb Raider first of all, probably on my nephew's original PlayStation. Um, but as already mentioned, I didn't touch the franchise until much later, just because of the PCs I had. 
I actually won a copy of Tomb Raider 3 for PC after writing a letter to uh, I wrote letter of the month for PC Zone. Uh, and it was one of the random gifts they PC sent me. Zone. You're, you're like a published yeah. game critic. <laughs> That's yeah. right, yeah. Um, that was actually a letter about Duke Nukem 3D, a, a map I'd made. But anyway, yeah. So one of the random, they sent me this box of random stuff, mouse mats, a really cheap gamepad and all that kind of stuff. But in there was a copy of Tomb Raider 3. It was probably the best part of the bundle. Um, and I know Tomb Raider 3 obviously came uh, quite a bit later. But like you, it was one of those titles to push me into buying a dedicated 3D card. Um there was a section I recall where there was a room and there was water down below and there was these blocks that you had to jump across, um, jump from one block to the other, but they were translucent. And that section was not only ugly, but it was pretty much unplayable on what was then my Pentium 200 MMX. So, you know, for the time, it wasn't a bad machine, but it was a standard, you know, one megabyte 2D graphics card. Um, And, yeah, that just chugged. So like you, Neil, it was it was night and day when I eventually got my Banshee card, which is what I got, which is 3DFX as well. And my goodness, Lara never looked so good, Neil. <laughs> yeah. And things like the transparent surfaces and the water um, just became draw dropping. Uh, so more so for me than the increase in resolution, which was also um, you know now available to me. So yeah, it was a game to upgrade your system for. Uh, interesting that you mentioned the Banshee. Uh, I think that was the second Voodoo card that I had. So I had a 3DFX one. Um, mm. Back then, you know, the 3DFX design was farmed out, and and lots of hardware developers could could license and make these these cards. So you'd go into a shop, and on the shelf, you know, there would just be some bizarrely named 3D accelerator card. You know, Super Phantom 400, and that was that was my first 3DFX card. And then the second <laughs> one was a it was a banshee and i think it was um a creative labs branded one it was like the th- that's the one i had yeah came with incoming as a packing game well, that's right it wasn't the 3d blaster was it i think that was a device yes it was it. Or was no, it, I thought was it, it was 3D the 3D Blaster? Blaster. I'm pretty sure it was the 3D Blaster, but it was yeah. the only. It was the first one to be standalone. Whereas the Voodoo One and Two, you needed to plug it into your 2D card. Do you remember? That's and, right. Yeah. So yeah. the Banshee was a Voodoo Two with a 2D card. I think looking back on it, I think the specs had been cut a little bit compared to having two dedicated cards. And some people say that's not the way to do it if you want to enjoy it in the yeah. modern day. I loved it. I loved it. I didn't uh, notice. Yeah at the time um same it was a great card and from yeah. then on out it was 2d and 3d in every card that i got moving forward yeah yeah good yeah. memories anyway um getting back to this port you really do need to check out modern vintage gamers video on this uh, and many there are many other you there, there's such a buzz of excitement about this there are lots of youtube videos covering this so go and check it out um it, maybe also go and look at some of the other tomb raider games on the gba to just see what publishers who are charging good money for this considered to be a first part you, you know a, a top of the line game that you should go down to the shop and buy a 2d tomb raider game and then look at this thing and you can make your mind up it's just really incredible causing a lot of excitement and rightly so what's the longest you've owned and used a single computer neil and i, and I don't mean that you've kept it while you've got others um, and you've bought another a, a newer model i mean the longest you've actually actively used a computer system without buying an updated one um that would probably have to be the amiga 500 because as soon as you get into pcs there's no strict baseline for your game requirements so on the amiga the atari st the cpc spectrums even yes there were upgrade options for all of them but it was understood that there was a baseline spec and 99 percent of the titles were catered for that so that it would reach the biggest audience possible but when i moved to a pc everything just became this moving target for for better or for worse It became a a moving target. My first was a 486SX. When I got it, I was the king of the world. I was playing TFX. I could run anything I wanted. Day of the Tentacle, Wing Commander, Mega Race. I was having so much fun with it. Uh, And then over time, I started seeing this thing on game boxes called a DX266. Hmm. And more RAM was needed. And then a CD-ROM was needed. And then CD 3D accelerators, as we just talked about, were needed and so on and so on. So from the moment that I got a PC, it was a machine forever changing. And, um, uh, you know, th- that then presented another struggle as a gamer, which is do you want to be on the cutting edge by constantly upgrading your PC? 
and enjoying the productivity and all the other things that you can do on a PC? Or do you want to just never have to think about that and get a console and you'll know that everything will run until the next model comes out? It might even run backwardsly, you know, compatible on the next model. But you'll be cutting edge at first. It will get older. It will still run everything. And even at the end of its lifetime, and if we're talking about, let's say, the Xbox 360 or the PlayStation 3 era, its lifetime is eight or nine years. I'm not sure that we'll see console cycles that long ever again, but it was a huge amount of time. And and that machine was relevant and current for that entire cycle. And you never had to think about upgrading it. Um, your return on your investment for that initial outlay for an Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3, even if you bought it as a launch system, you got your money's worth out of that thing. You know, nine years out of a system. You're doing well if you get that, right? I think all the PC gamers have just left the chat, Neil, because <laughs> <laughs> you, I say this I, as an avid PC gamer. <laughs> I did the same thing, though, Neil. I eventually ended up jumping to consoles for that very same reason. Well, 50 years is the target, Neil, or at least 30 years at the very least. Um, this is according to an article by Carl Svensson on datagurb.se. See the show notes because I may have pronounced that wrong, um, which was posted to the subreddit by Paul, a.k.a. Homsky. And in this article, Carl references the work of Plume.net and the concept of a fictional computer built to last for 50 years. The principle being that by making it modular and robust, you could make a machine to last that long. And the original work basically uses typewriters as an example of that. But the recent 2022 article by Carl postulates that perhaps this already exists in the form of his Commodore Amiga A1200. You can perhaps see why I jumped on this one, Neil. Um, Uh (laughs) He's quite detailed in his article about what has been done to keep his A1200 running, things like recapping, um, but he details the fact that that was done as preventative maintenance, not out of necessity. Um, And he's also had to replace some mechanical elements like, of course, the floppy drive and the hard drive, either with working ones or uh, non-mechanical options. But all that said, as he points out, uh, the machine for the most part Uh, has already lasted 30 years so part of his logic is that the a1200 was already modular and as we've seen in recent times neil still remains quite upgradable thoughts neil is the amiga 1200 or (laughs) any amiga for that matter uh, the 50 year old computer and if not what would you put in its place keeping in mind modular upgrades are acceptable well um yeah it's upgradable yes modular i don't know there's plenty on it that isn't socketed so uh, by modular do you mean desoldering a surface mount chip (laughs) and putting it back on or not um yes you can upgrade it there are upgrades available but i'd argue that a big box machine offers that a lot more for example a pc if you wanted to stick with the amigas the four amiga 4000 um of that generation or even go all the way back to the apple II with its eight or so expansion slots that it had in there so whether or not a computer can be classed as a 50 year old computer out of the gates um i don't know that that comes down to what you want to do with it i guess and you gave uh, you, you mentioned a typewriter there okay that that's fine that's made for a specific purpose whereas a computer is is a multi-purpose device so it gets a bit more complicated do you remember that story some years ago about the us um nuke the the missile system uh, still running on 8 inch floppies uh, oh, that was right. running yep. on an yeah it was running on an ibm series 1 machine from the 1970s and I think they were scheduled to update and replace them around 2018. I don't know whether or not that has happened. I'm, I'm not privy to the uh, inner workings at the Pentagon, but um, <laughs> they were they were scheduled to do it. And, um, you know, that was knocking on to 50, get, getting close to 50 years, and we've not had Armageddon yet. So I'd, I'd class it as a success. But again, it's, it's a system that was being used for one or two purposes rather than a, a multifunction or multipurpose machine that we'd expect on our home machines. If we're looking at home computers, if you wanted to treat it like a typewriter and just write a book without distraction, sure, you could, you could do that on an Apple II. You could do it with a nice soothing green screen. You could do it on that chap's Amiga 1200. But I'm not sure that that proves that it's a 50-year microcomputer. Um, certainly wasn't designed to be a 50-year microcomputer. Uh, it, it's more 
it's fit for that purpose, that specific purpose. And with some maintenance, sure, you you can keep it going. Um, I don't know. I don't know, Chris. I, I love seeing, for example, 50-year-old classic cars cruising up and down on, on a sunny day. I, I love to see them. But I wouldn't describe them as being a car that you'd buy with the intention of driving for 50 years. No, yeah, that's that's a really fair comment. Um, for me, as much as I love the to say the Amiga, uh, and maybe I would be saying it if the '90s had played out differently, I think I'd have to go with a PC. Um, if anything, you know, even fits this gap. Uh, if we had to pick something from the past or retro, um, I'd happily say an early Pentium era PC, so we can at least play Tomb Raider. Um, you've got a good solid CPU. Uh, you've got upgradable graphics and you've got upgradable storage. And I think most importantly, the internet is already a thing at that point, rather than being shoehorned onto a device that it really wasn't really wasn't ready for it. Um, surprisingly, Neil, the last PC I purchased, which was a cheap Acer desktop, actually lasted me about six or seven years. And when I say lasted, it was still working fine the day I sold it, um, complete with the original box. Uh, keeping in mind, I'm not pushed into upgrading all the time by modern games as much as I used to be. Um, I could have kept that for another six years at least, I think. I just happen to be offered a bargain on the PC that I'm using right now. I think I'm slowing down finally, Neil, is, is what it is. I don't feel the need to upgrade all the time like we did when we jumped on those 3DFX cards. Um, if it works, I'm keeping it. Are you still driven to constantly upgrade, Neil? Um yeah, yeah. Uh, just thinking of stories like that. I, I just remembered I have an aunt in her 70s who still uses a Windows 98 PC from from the late 90s. Wow. Uh, it's completely offline. She won't go on the internet with it. She has another computer for that, <laughs> but she still uses it to do her, her home accounts and spreadsheets and things like that. So that, that's a good example of a machine that's, that's knocking on for a few decades now. Um but yeah, what, what drives me these days to upgrade is no longer the, the video games, it's, it's video rendering. So extra cores, RAM, GPU power, it can save me a huge amount of time in productivity. So yeah, uh, and I always have a secondary machine now. And um, in fact, I think at the moment I've got a, a tertiary machine as well, into which all of my old parts filter down into, they're demoted. So hmm. the oldest of yeah. those machines is probably coming up on 10 years old now, and it's still perfectly usable for daily tasks. But there's a big gulf between a machine 10 years old and a machine from the mid 90s, for example. You know, if you go back to the mid 90s, you've got a PC that is probably hasn't got enough RAM, is constantly paging out memory, thrashing the hard disk, taking minutes to, to boot up, minute, minutes to open a program, probably struggle, struggles if you try to run multiple programs. There are, of course, exceptions if you've got it completely pimped out with ram and everything but that's my memory of that period go back a little bit more and you might be in a windows environment where you have to ac actually disable the windows background to free up more memory so that there's <laughs> less paging going on that's but if you go back to a machine that's 10 years old windows 7 will run perfectly fine on it windows 10 will probably run perfectly fine on it it will boot up quickly you can put an ssd in there and you know, the boot times are quick, the, the loading times are quick. You, you've got multi-core CPUs, you've got hyper-threading. It's a very, it, it, you know, 30 years, it sounds like a silly thing to say, but 30 years is vastly different to 10 years in, in this well, context. Yes. <laughs> it really I know what is. You mean. You know, it's yeah. more like 100 years. Um, and uh, will that 10-year-old machine of mine be capable of those tasks in 40 years' time if it's still working? And when we're all, I don't know, we'll be piloting our armchair drones in augmented reality through the metaverse in 40 years' time. You know, that's that's what we'll be doing. You can hold me to that. Um, and uh, and I may well say, can I still write a novel that I've always been write, meaning to write? Could I still write that book on my Windows 7 machine if I wanted? Yes, I absolutely could. I could load up, you know, Microsoft Word. I could even do that on Microsoft word 95 and i could still write that book but would i call it a machine designed to last 50 years no i wouldn't <laughs> it's just a machine that still happens to work like a classic car still happens to be able to drive because someone's looked after it and haven't left it in a garage where a hole in the roof is dripping on it um so yeah uh, uh, and would i put put the put my trust in in that 40 year old or 50 year old machine to navigate and drive my 
driverless armchair drone powered by a Ryzen <laughs> processor and a Windows 7 PC to drive me to the nursing home? No, I absolutely would not trust it to do that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Neil, no faith. Just recap it and she'll be right, mate. <laughs> I think I think while it's fun to try and pick an everlasting PC from the past, perhaps uh, to a point, mm-hmm. it's actually the modern offerings that could potentially, like we've just discussed, make that a reality. But then why would we do that if that slows progress? Um, anyway, check out the article by Carl via the links in the show notes. Our community question of the week is all about your favorite video game shop of old. Well, the gory details. Was it dark and menacing? Was it cool and fresh? Was there a dodgy piracy operation going on in the back room? Does it still exist? These are the questions that we asked you. Chris, why don't you kick us off with your own memories before we get to our community answers? Oh, Neil, I tell you what, any forum to talk about my independent local computer game shop in Royal Tubridge Wells in Kent, which was called Megabytes. Um, They started off at the top of town in an area called St. John's Road, and they became my regular stop off on the way home from school because it was right on route. Um, And that was during the period where I was just, I had the Spectrum Plus 3 at that point in time. So I go in, I can see it now. I can see it. I know where the building is. The building still exists, but it's a stereo shop now. Um, And I can walk in in my mind and I can see all the 8-bit games down the left-hand side section, which is where the door was that you walked in. The counters at the end with the nice smiley guy whose name I think was John, but um, that may be a a blurred memory. But anyway, the the owner of the place. And so that was the 8-bit section. And then he went over to the right-hand side of the store, and that was more where the Amigas and the STs and all of that kind of stuff were. Pretty much most of the time, the Amiga, there was one in the window playing the Juggler demo. That's where I first Mm -hmm. saw that. Um, and then there was always another one. You could, you could test them all. You could trial games before you buy them, uh, before you buy them, before you bought them. Um, and most of the time, the staff were there playing test drive, or they were playing carrier command. So that, that was the first place I saw those two games as well. Um, and then bizarrely, I also saw them, and it was after I'd bought an Amiga, I also, that's the first place I saw an Amstrad CPC 464, and I think they were playing Barbarian on that. Um, so, yeah, I can see that store straight away. They then closed that to move to a smaller premises down in the historic end of town on the high street. Um, and But still, it was just part of my life, Neil, to go down to that shop. So that was a small, pokey little shop walk in test benches down the right hand side after you'd walked in main counter for actually purchasing stuff down the left amiga games were right in the back corner that's the place where i saw a cd tv and played psycho killer played you know (laughs) made random selections at various points in the uh, full motion video um but um (laughs) yeah I, i can just see it i can even now as i'm talking about it i can see the whole place i can see the owner of the place um Maybe I need to take this if anybody from Tunbridge Wells or Kent or that area that remembers the store, if you happen to know the owner and if he's still around, can you please apologise to him on my behalf for the time I didn't buy Armageddon by Stegnosis? Um, He's probably wondering why because they put it aside for me. I bought it from volunteers at the top end of town. I do apologise about that. (laughs) I'm sorry. Uh, But anyway, it's still waiting for you. It's still there. The things that stuck in my memory uh, after all these years. But yeah, fantastic, fantastic fantastic shop what about yourself well, Neil? well i'm also interested to know if anyone can remember this particular shop um I, i'll talk about a couple um the, the first one would be very typical of anyone in the uk which would be dixon's on the high street so that was a big chain and the reason i'd go there is because they would have the machines on display running so you could actually see them whereas uh, a lot of the independent uh, video game stores i went to only had one perhaps machine running because they were usually cramped into very very small stores with floor to ceiling games um so uh, i'd go to dixon's to see things running but i wouldn't ever buy they very rarely sold games actually um sometimes they had good things in the bargain bins there but um i would go to the independent stores so one i went to was in weymouth down in dorset on the seafront in amongst all of the seaside arcades so we go play some arcades go into this little um, cramped video game store called uh, Double Drive Computers. And um, they specialized in, you know, they had the console games, but they had floor to ceiling, big box PC and Amiga games, which is what I was really interested in. And um, I bought so many games from there, but it's also the place I bought 
oh, I remember buying a four megabyte RAM upgrade for my 486 from there. And I think it cost me a little over a hundred pounds back then Oof. for four meg. <laughs> And th- and this was a reasonably priced shop. They weren't, you know, they didn't rip people off. Um, so yeah, I used to buy a lot of games from there, and and quite questionably, uh, um, well, amazingly, they're still running this chain, but they they've rebranded and renamed themselves. They're no longer called Double Drive Computers. They're called Double D Computers, which kind of double density. You- I'm sure. Well, just just double D just makes you think that it's turned into a bra shop or something. No, 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 um, I'm I'm trying to excuse it. It's it's, it's stands for double density. I don't think think there's any excuse. They should have thought this through before they renamed the video game shop to double D. But all all it sells now, I'm sure it sells a bit more, but I I have no need to go in there anymore because it's mostly um, ink cartridges, printer cartridges, toner, consumables because how do you compete with the online world you know they've obviously carved out their niche and that's how they've they they found a way of surviving where so many haven't uh, and that's what they do now and the other one i just mentioned quickly and i want to know if anyone out there can remember this uh paul in dorset in the old market there was this guy who would buy and sell games um so it was basically a used video game shop and it was just like an Aladdin's cave of every generation of gaming system. Every game. He had Neo Geos. He had 8-bit titles. He had bang up-to-date titles. And you would take the games you didn't want. You would trade them. You'd get a little bit of a discount on the game that you really wanted. But did anyone else go there in the, in that marketplace in Pool? I'd love to know. One day he just disappeared. Um, and I hope I hope that he disappeared and, and he got all of that stuff online because he had such a wonderful stock. And that's the place where I bought most of my Ultima games that I used to collect. Um, and I would buy them for less than three pounds each. Wow. And and now they're, they're worth a huge amount. <clears throat> but unfortunately, I don't have them anymore. But, you know, those were the kind of bargains that you could find there. So let's get to our community answers. You've heard our answers. Um now, I see that Duncan has left a very long answer, and I don't think it would be fair to read out producer Duncan's answer on the show, even though we've given ours. Um, so go and have a read of Duncan's memories there. Uh, the next one, the next most popular at the time of recording is Richard Shears. He says, while we did have a local corner shop selling Mastertronic games, so Mastertronic was a, a budget um, a range, a budget publisher here in the UK, uh, it was great for quick pocket money purchases, my favorite place to go was the legendary John Menzies. Oh, yeah, I went to John Menzies in Weymouth yeah, as well. Yeah, I remember John Menzies. That was a chain. Yeah. Uh, he said, this involved a bus ride into a larger town nearby. Therefore, it was more of a planned excursion. Also, one filled with chances, uh, filled with chance, as there would be a good chance that the title I've coveted uh, because of the magazine review would not be in stock. Oh. Thankfully, however, they were very naive and unaware of the ability to back up games. Oh, God, where's <gasps> this going? Also, with a large staff rotation, they wouldn't recognize repeat returners. So I now hereby confess that perhaps <laughs> I returned a lot more cop games than I kept. I must now bow my head in shame, for I surely must have helped with the downfall of the once great empire known as John Menzies. Rich, I have to have a go at Rich now, Neil, because it's because of people like him that I had trouble returning a game to WH Smith once because they assumed that's what I was doing. The game wouldn't load on my system. I, it was a genuine return, and they thought I was just pirating it and returning it to the shop. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> Here we go. Pajaco6502. When I was younger, I literally fed my gaming habit wherever I could. I bought games in newsagents, shops, and even a petrol station. But my main haul was a Saturday market stall on Canvey Island, where I grew up. Every week, armed with my two to three pound pocket money, I'd rifle through all the full price games I couldn't normally afford. But most of the time, the good old Mastertronic or Codemasters budget ranges came to the rescue. Yes, they did. See, that's what you oh, should do yeah. when you don't have enough money for a full price game. Buy a budget game. Don't resort to crime. That's exactly right. Those bargain bids were always great. And Codemasters was just fan. The games weren't necessarily always great, but they were good enough to spend your pocket money on. They just hit that level. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, Reading Glasses Man says, Neil's comment about chemists took me all the way back to Collins Chemist near where I was raised. I could be wrong, but uh, in my flashback was a panel full of Mastertronic and Firebird cassettes for my Commodore 16 and 64. 
I love that place, and looking back, I'm amazed he spared any space for computer games since this chemist was so small there wasn't a huge amount of room to move. After that, my main store to visit was a computer shop in town which had all those horizontally lined panels. Okay, so the slat walls, I think he means. I loved that for all the uh, computers on show. Seeing the games running and dreaming about owning any of the more powerful machines. Amigas and Atari STs seemed so exotic and so out of reach until my parents were able to get me an Amiga. Talk about aspirational products. Yeah, beautiful. There you go. Um, yeah. yeah. Even in even in chemists where there was little room, you would find just a revolving display with cassettes hung on them. Um, it's true, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, on the on the hanging, yeah, the hanging style ones. Super drug yeah. or boots or anywhere like that. Yeah. 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 You'd associate well, boots. The smell. The yes. smell of a chemist with video games. <laughs> Again, Neil, I can see the layout of boots in my hometown, Tunbridge Wells, and also the, the the town next door, Tunbridge, two completely separate places. But I knew I, I can see in my mind's eye where the Electron games were when they still stocked them, where the Spectrum games were, and all of that. It's crazy the memories that stick. Um, yeah, there's a bit of a do do check out the the subreddit guys because there is a bit of a conversation about why were chemists from from international yes. um, <laughs> listeners why were chemists selling computer games in the UK um, the <laughs> main one was boots and they became yeah. kind of not quite a department store but they almost went that way didn't they neil yeah yeah they did your um your photography they developed your photos they sold video yeah. games as well as everything else and it's the power of these memories i mean i can see i, I can hear the way you're describing things so vividly and, and the submissions we've had to the subreddit have probably been the most detailed answers to any question we've ever asked. And it's because yeah. they're such powerful memories. And that's what drove me to create this recreated 90s, 80s video game shop here in the cave, because I just wanted to step back in time and step back in there again. Nice. And you see that when people walk in there, um, just, ha just how important it is and what it means to them. And so we wrap up today's show with our community question of the week for next week dive into our subreddit reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro where you will find the latest show pinned at the top as well as our community question of the week which is what was your favorite joystick what did you get on with and also what was your least favorite joystick was there a stick that you absolutely hated was there one that you loved but it was just so fragile that it broke every time you played your favorite game on it so you couldn't use it uh, daily thompson's decathlon will no doubt come up on this question and um, I will answer it straight away, the Conix Navigator. That was the indestructible stick for me. Let us know the answer over on our subreddit and submit your new stories to appear in next week's show. Thank you for listening and take care. Bye. This Week in Retro was presented by Neil Thomas from RNC The Cave and Chris Winter from 005 Agima. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash This Week in Retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.